We are less than three months until the 2024 presidential election and after a turbulent start for Democrats, Vice President Kamala Harris has taken full control of the campaign, bringing new energy to the ticket that many are saying feels like 2008 all over again. In just a few weeks, Harris has been able to sweep away former President Trump's lead in almost all of the battleground states, leveling the playing field and putting the Republican ticket on defense as they work to figure out how to refresh their strategy and come up with a plan to take on Democrats. Across the country, Harris and Walls have raked in record-setting fundraising numbers and brought crowds together not seen in a long time for Democrats. That's not sitting well with Trump, who's gone on Truth Social making wild claims the Harris campaign is using AI to inflate crowd sizes. Another point of attack for the former president and his allies is the fact that Harris has yet to sit for unscripted interviews, something the former president has done multiple times, including just this week with billionaire Trump supporter Elon Musk. But for now, Harris is riding high and pushing forward with momentum. Julia Manchester caught up with Decision Desk HQ's Scott Tranter to go over the latest numbers and where both candidates stand in the poll. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Trump sat down with Elon Musk, the, fa uh, the owner of X, for an interview on the platform last night or this week. It seems like we're getting definitely a more reserved version of Trump compared to recent public appearances. Wanted to get what your takeaways were from the interview. Well, it was long. Um, that's for sure. I, you know, look, this is this is what Donald Trump did in 2016. He's accepted every single interview. He would call in. He'd be out there. This is certainly a different strategy than we saw six months ago when he wouldn't even really debate some of the uh, his GOP primary opponents. So I think that's reflective of what he thinks um, where he's at in the polls, which is, you know, we're seeing a surging Kamala Harris. Right. And we know that in the polls, uh, re some recent polls from battleground states show Kamala Harris uh, surpassing Trump in three battleground states in particular, according to a New York Times Siena College poll, um, you know, by four points in some of those states. Um, you know, this is a pretty major feat for Harris, who's only been in the race for a few weeks. How much of this can be attributed to her campaign's honeymoon phase or is there something bigger at play here? Uh, it, you know, it's it's certainly a honeymoon phase, right? So she's getting a lot of good press, a lot of good coverage. You know, Tim Walls had a little bit of a rocky start, but not as much as J.D. Vance. Um, she's going into the convention. She has, as noted by the Trump campaign, not done very many, if any, on the record interviews thus far. Um, so, you know, once those questions come and once those things come, we may see a hit in the polls. But right now she's enjoying a surge. And the question is, is will it last a long time? Right, right. So, um, you know, looking at all the swing states together, where is the Harris campaign sitting right now? I know that she's made some gains in particular in some of the Sun Belt states, Georgia, North Carolina. Um, you know, is that where we're going to see this election come down to? Yeah, no, it's still it's you know, I feel like we always talk about Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. And I think that's what we're going to continue to talk about. Interestingly enough, in the Hill DDHQ polling and average, she's closed with to within one point in most of those states, one and a half points in Michigan, um, which is much closer than Joe Biden was um, just a month ago. And so that that's those those are those are going to be the key states for either campaign. But you bring up Georgia and some of the Sun Belt states. One interesting thing to note this week, the Trump campaign lay, uh, laid out a whole bunch of new ad spending, a couple million dollars in all those states, but twenty three million dollars in the state of Georgia. Now, we've seen that polling average get close. Trump is still ahead by about three points. But the fact that he's putting so much money in Georgia tells us that the polls are probably moving a little bit faster there um, than other places. So it, it certainly looks like Harris has closed the gap and is trending the right way um, and making this a much more competitive race. Right, right. And want to head out west to uh, Nevada and Arizona. We know that Democrats are making a massive ad by there. Um, you know, they're very much fighting to draw this contrast between Harris and Trump there. She was obviously there with Tim Walls uh, last week. What message should uh, Harris, uh, you know, be focusing on in order to impact opinion a voters' opinions of her? Well, she was recently in Nevada and she she took a page from the Trump playbook and, and basically came out for, you know, ta uh, no taxes on tips, which was something that Donald Trump did in Nevada a couple months ago. She did that while accepting the Culinary Workers um, uh, Union, which is very powerful in Nevada. So she she's being very aggressive out west. 
um, in states that, you know, quite frankly, Joe Biden was five, six, seven points behind. And there's two close Senate rates in the races in those two states. And so that's her kind of her fight, not only for the presidency, but, uh, you know, potentially have a chance of saving the Senate. Harris has shifted her stance on one issue that, you know, impacts a lot of voters, particularly in Nevada, with uh, the hospitality industry, and that's the tax on tips. Uh, You know, Trump and his campaign say that she's taken a page from his uh, playbook saying that she will implement a no tax on tips policy, obviously a push in Nevada. you know, does this show, I think, uh, does this sort of, um, I guess, illustrate the strength of the hospitality and service industry in that state? It absolutely does. I mean, when was the last time we saw a Republican and a pre- and a Democratic presidential candidate agree on a major issue? Um, it takes taxes on tip tips in a state like Nevada um, when they're both fine for union workers who are going to dis- determine who wins that state. Um, yeah, that's a huge issue. Um, and something the, the the Harris campaign has no shame in saying, yeah, we, we took it from Trump um, because it's a good idea. So that tells you how powerful that union is and, and how powerful an issue that is. I want to move to a no, new poll that was released by the Financial Times and the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business that shows Harris leading Trump 42 to 41 percent when asked about who is trusted more to handle the economy. This is obviously a big deal uh, you know, for Democrats, particularly in this election, because we saw when Biden was at the top of the ticket, he was doing um, you know, much worse when asked uh, when voters were asked about how it hit. Uh, his handle, his handling of the economy, what they thought of that. Um, you know, does this represent a major shift for voters going into the election? Can we expect this to last? Ah, I'd like to see it in a couple more polls, but yes, that is that is a very significant shift because it has been pretty much widely polled over the last two, three years that Donald Trump and the Republicans have been more trusted on the economy. So this this one polls a, a canary in the coal mine, and we're going to see what that looks like over the next couple of months. But yeah, th- this is a definite shift and something that, that, that should have the Trump campaign worried. I want to shift gears and go to the Robert F. Kennedy Jr. campaign. He suffered a major blow um, after a judge ruled this week that he should not appear on New York State's ballot, uh, saying he falsely claimed New York residency and nominating positions despite living in California. Scott, do you think this could have a domino effect on his status in other states or is this more of a New York centric issue? Yeah, no, I think this is the beginning of something. You know, look, the Democrats have uh, been spending a little bit of time in in super PAC money and a little bit of effort researching some of these ballot access laws in these various states. And now we're in mid-August coming on to September. A lot of these states have to make decisions on these ballot applications over the next two to four weeks. And so this this New York salvo is the first one we're going to see. I think we're going to see this this fight play out in a few more states before it's all said and done. Yeah, and we know that while Trump had hoped RFK staying in the race would cause more damage to the Democratic ticket, it seems like uh, RFK is taking more support away from Trump himself. If RFK's campaign continues through November, how much of an impact could this have on Trump? Look, it, it, it appears that RFK and some of the most recent polls we have over the last month takes slightly more from Trump than Biden. But here's the big stat. Six weeks ago, in the Hill DDHQ RFK average, he was at about 8%. Today he's at four. So his support is cut in half. And four is right around where we see third party candidates do in uh, presidential elections right before they end up getting one or 2% of the vote on election day. So the, the, I think the headline here is RFK's campaign is certainly losing its momentum and uh, the voters are kind of fleeing to their respective parties. I'm not sure how much of an effect he's going to have, except for some of these individual states like a Pennsylvania or potentially a Michigan, where, you know, even if he takes a half a point, that might be the difference maker. And as always, Scott, before I let you go, what is the latest decision desk forecasting now um, up now with Trump versus Harris? So i uh, give you a little preview. It's going to be launched publicly next week, but I was fooling around with it this morning. Look, we've got Harris ahead. Her surging in all these different states, her spectacular fundraising. Now it's going to be still razor close, but I would expect Harris when we launch it next week to probably be a 54 to 56% favorite, which is not where it was. You know, Trump was the favorite when we were talking a month ago. So this is certainly a change in the race. Yeah, it's amazing how much can change in a month. Scott Tranter, as always, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. 
The momentum shown from the Harris campaign over the last few weeks has been staggering. I am so excited, especially with what? Kind of like the feeling I had when Obama got here. It's the energy, it's the it's the aggressiveness. I'm really excited for the campaign. I love what, what she's talking about with education and abortion rights. In just the first 24 hours after President Biden stepped out of the race, Harris's campaign raked in $81 million. Compare that to Trump's nearly $53 million bump following his May conviction in New York. The Harris campaign raised another $36 million in the day after she announced Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as her running mate. But new numbers suggest that not all Americans share the enthusiasm. According to a new AP NORC poll, two in three U.S. adults are at least somewhat pessimistic about the state of U.S. politics. Those numbers come after President Biden dropped out of the race and are only slightly up from last fall. Meantime, the same poll shows one in five U.S. adults say democracy is so seriously broken that it doesn't matter who wins the presidential election in November. With so many Americans disillusioned with politics, Democrats are looking to energize voters at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago next week. For what to expect at the DNC, we're bringing in White House columnist Niall Stanage. Niall, you are going to be on the ground in Chicago. The Republicans had Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock. Who are going to be the Democratic equivalents? Well, I don't know in terms of celebrity appearances who the equivalents will be, but in terms of politics, obviously former President Obama is a kind of rock star within the Democratic Party. He's going to speak. We expect former President Clinton to speak, as well as Hillary Clinton. Now, uh, the current president, he is also going to be there. He will also be speaking. And so those are the big uh, headline attractions for an event that Democrats hope will really capitalize upon this sense of momentum that you referred to around the Harris campaign. It's typical, of course, for candidates to get a little bit of a bump from a convention. We'll have to see if that happens for Vice President Harris, because, of course, she has already uh, risen in the polls over the past few weeks. What do you make of the whole Biden dynamics? He's going to be speaking on Monday, which there reportedly is still some animosity that remains between Biden and top Democrats who helped push him out of the presidential race. That first day speaking spot, necessarily not necessarily the most sought after. Are Democrats going to be able to present a united front here? I think it will be be a united front in the sense that Democrats are broadly happy that Vice President Harris is the nominee. And obviously, they take a lot of um, enthusiasm or, or, or encouragement from the fact that she has now erased the lead that former President Trump had enjoyed over President Biden. But you do make a great point about the Biden speech on Monday. I think that's an awkward moment by its nature. I think it's a bittersweet moment for the incumbent president. Uh, you know, he thought he was going to be going to Chicago to accept the nomination, that that was a foregone conclusion, that that would be him then moving on to the final general election footage, footing, excuse me, against former President Trump. Instead, this is something of a swan song for the president. It's a, a difficult emotional moment for him and his family. And I think that's something that will be uh, challenging for the party to manage. And there's some talk that he might not even be there when Harris officially kind of receives her coronation. That seems like it would be pretty awkward if he's back in Washington while all this big celebration is going on in Chicago. Yeah, I agree. I think it's awkward either way, in a sense. I mean, if he stays in Chicago until Thursday night when Vice President Harris will be officially uh, crowned or ceremonially crowned as the nominee, then I'm sure there'll be cutaway shots to him and his reactions as she accepts the nomination and gives her big speech. Um, and that in itself could be awkward, could really sort of underline the very unusual circumstances by which she became the nominee. On the other hand, I take your point completely. If he goes back to Washington, if he's out, you know, gone from Chicago, then it's, it's awkward by its nature. You would normally expect him or a, a, an incumbent president to be passing the torch on to a chosen successor. So it's, it's tricky either way. What do you think is going to be the overlying message for the DMC from Democrats? I heard Westmore, governor of Maryland, talking about how he wants everyone draped in the flag, chants of USA, USA. That's not usually really something that Democrats are all that comfortable portraying. But do you think that will be kind of the mantra of this DNC? 
Yes, I think it will to a degree. I mean, obviously, there seems to be an attempt from conservatives and from allies of former President Trump okay. to paint Vice President Harris particularly as sort of outside the American mainstream. We hear this talk about her as a quote unquote San Francisco liberal and so forth. So for Democrats, yes, they do want to drape this occasion in patriotism um, to some extent. The other thing I would say that is notable listening to the vice president make her speeches on the campaign trail is this overall framework that she's putting forward about the campaign being about the future as typified by her versus the past as typified by former President Trump. One hears the, the crowds at her events chanting, we're not going back. And she trying to uh, emphasize that point and trying to really position herself as the forward looking candidate and trying to cast uh, Mr. Trump as the backwards looking candidate. One of the issues that Trump and Republicans have been using to attack Harris is the southern border. Immigration has consistently been in the top five of issues for voters this election cycle. How do you expect Democrats to try to blunt that issue at the DNC? Is it the whole we had a bipartisan bill that Trump killed for political gain? I think it probably is. We've already seen that theme be sounded in some of uh, the Harris team's advertising. They are really trying to make the argument, which is, you know, ha has some legitimacy to it, that Mr. Trump from outside killed that bipartisan agreement that you're talking about. And had that bipartisan agreement gone forward, among other things, it would have increased the number of uh, Border Patrol agents and enforcement around and along the border. There are some difficulties with that argument, less in terms of the substance of it and more that we see an abundance of opinion polling indicating that the public looks very, very dimly upon President Biden's record on immigration. It's pretty much his worst polling issue. We see disapproval numbers roughly twice as high as approval numbers on the border. And then you have the related issue where, you know, Vice President Harris was very much identified with his migration policies. She now balks at the idea that she was the border czar, so-called. And it's true that that was never an official post, but she was frequently described that way at the time and did have a leading role in trying to mitigate the long term drivers of migration. By its nature, that's not an area that you can show much progress in very quickly. Shifting gears to the Middle East, Harris has been more and more vocal about a ceasefire in Gaza, even saying this at one of her rallies. Take a listen. I have been clear. Now is the time to get a ceasefire deal and get the hostage deal done. Meantime, there are concerns about protesters at the convention. This seems like one of the thorniest issues DNC organizers are going to have to deal with. How are they going to walk the tightrope between showing support for Israel on the one hand and the anger, real anger, that many in the party feel over the plight of Palestinians? With great difficulty, I think, to my mind, this is perhaps the single most difficult issue within the Democratic coalition. So many um, issues that we talk about in politics break along quite neatly partisan lines, and this one simply doesn't. It divides the Democratic Party almost down the middle. In fact, most Democratic voters are more sympathetic now to the Palestinian side than the Israeli side in that conflict. That being said, the majority of Democratic elected officials are still very pro-Israel, and obviously you have to consider voters in the center ground as well. Basically, what Vice President Harris seems to be arguing is she has a strong commitment to Israel's security, a strong commitment to Israel's right to self-defense, particularly from outside adversaries like Iran. But she has shown, at least rhetorically, a willingness to be more critical of Israeli policies, more critical of the enormous death toll that we have seen in Gaza, estimated by local authorities to now be around 40,000 people. So she's trying to walk that tightrope, as you put it, suggesting she would, I think, be a little less um, forgiving of Israel than President Biden has been, but also not cast herself as in any way a quote unquote anti-Israel uh, person or anti-Israel potential president. Democrats are often criticized as elitist and coastal. I wonder if you think there's going to be an effort to reshape that during the DNC. Many see the Dems VP pick Tim Walls as a good candidate for that role, being that he's from the Midwest and has this kind of down home folksy demeanor. What do you see as Walls role being at the convention? 
So I, I think you've put it very well there, Drew. I think one of the advantages or assets that Governor Walsh has is that Midwestern persona that you're talking about, this sort of plain spoken, affable, but can be more sort of um, strong or aggressive if he needs to be sort of every man idea. It's notable to me that Vice President Harris often refers to him as Coach Walls when she is making her speeches, alluding to his role as a high school football coach, but also sort of trying to position him in a very mainstream way. He, I think, can do that for the Harris campaign. He's very difficult to caricature as the kind of... Uh, quote unquote, out of touch liberal that you're referring to. And so that is really his big calling card. The Trump campaign and other conservatives have obviously tried to have a go at him about everything from his military record to some of the legislation he approved as governor. Um, but so far, I think he has retained that sort of uh, everyman um, persona. Several Democrats are avoiding the convention, notably Montana Senator John Tester, who's locked in a tight re-election campaign. Uh, we should note that several rep prominent Republicans skipped the RNC last month. But as for the Democrats not attending, is this typical red state Dems trying to distance themselves from the National Party or is there something else to it? I think that is largely what it is. I mean, someone like John Tester running in Montana has a very different um political landscape to navigate than someone running in, you know, Massachusetts or, or Connecticut or anywhere like that. And so there is typically a reluctance by figures like Tester to connect themselves too neatly with the National Democratic Party. So it's not an enormous surprise that he's choosing to keep his distance, not an enormous surprise that he wants to preserve a sort of independent political identity for the sake of strengthening his own chances of re-election in a state that is, is very, very strongly conservative by its nature. I mean, former President Trump carried Montana by a big, big margins in both elections that he contested. All right, that's all I got now. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. With Chicago gearing up for the DNC kickoff on Monday, some are drawing eerie comparisons to the last time the Windy City hosted, also a year when the incumbent president dropped out of the race. But party conventions these days look very different compared to 50 years ago. Rafael Bernal goes in depth into how they've changed over the years. National party conventions these days might seem predictable, but they're a lot better than beauty pageants. Until 1972, primaries were sometimes dismissed as beauty contests because they didn't really determine a party's nominee. Conventions were really selection processes where party insiders would pick the candidate they thought gave them the best chance of winning. Since primaries were beauty contests, they didn't even bother to have them in all 50 states. In 1952, Dwight Eisenhower didn't really win the Republican primaries, but delegates in the GOP convention picked him because he was leading in the polls. In 1960, you could say John F. Kennedy won the Mr. West Virginia pageant. He was a clear choice for Democrats that year, yeah, yeah, partly because of his looks, but party delegates were concerned the American people would not elect a Catholic. Once he won the primary in deeply Protestant West Virginia, those concerns went out the door. None of that means that a mystery candidate could jump up in the polls and unseat a presumptive nominee at a convention in 2024. And that's because of the 1968 Democratic Convention, which was such a mess. That year, President Johnson didn't think he could win the general election, so he withdrew. I shall not sue, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president leaving Vice President Hubert Humphrey in the lead for the Democratic nomination. Except another handsome Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, and Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota stood in the way. Humphrey won six primaries, Kennedy won five before he was assassinated, and Humphrey won zero to become the 1968 Democratic nominee. A lot is said about the chaos with anti-war riots and police abuse outside the convention in Chicago in 1968. But the inside was pretty messy too. Messy enough that Democrats changed the rules and Republicans soon after followed suit. It's the reason we have 50 primaries and caucuses to select the nominee and the reason party delegates are pledged to the winner of those contests. One big change came about. 
The voters don't always pick the candidate most likely to win, but the candidate they, partisan primary voters, vibe with. It happened the first time the new system was tested. In 1972, when Senator George McGovern of South Dakota beat Humphrey, only to lose the general election against President Nixon. McGovern was kind of the Bernie Sanders of his generation, and he had to push against the party establishment to win. Democrats later added superdelegates, big time party insiders who aren't bound to a candidate to keep that from happening again. Well, what does all that mean today? Well, for starters, conventions have become crowning ceremonies rather than selection processes. This year's Democratic convention could have been different after President Biden dropped out, releasing his pledged delegates. But those delegates were free to line up behind another candidate, and line up they did. To become the official nominee, Vice President Harris still needs a majority of delegates to vote for her, seemingly a done deal. That deal took political maneuvering that some might say is undemocratic, but it still beats a beauty contest. That's it for What's America Thinking. I'm Drew Petromo. Come back next week and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel.